So this on the left is my planet scale database that holds all of the records for all of the follower counts that we had every hour since I deployed the function. Welcome back to Let's Code. Today we're gonna go over something a little bit different. We're not gonna actually do much coding today. I'm going to cover a project I've already built. The project is a scheduled function written in Rust, deployed to Netlify that talks to a planet scale database. So very recently, Netlify deployed a uh, beta feature or preview feature, whatever you want to call it, that is scheduled functions. And basically what this is, if we scoot all the way down to the bottom here, is it is serverless functions that execute on a cron job, basically like a cron command, cron time, whatever you want to call it. In my case over here, you can see that I have a function that runs every hour. And it says it has an endpoint here. It doesn't actually have this endpoint. Netlify disables this endpoint for scheduled functions. But you can see that it's running every hour. If I, I can't show you the logs for some reason because Netlify decided that logs for experimental runtimes like Rust uh, shouldn't be shown for some reason. I don't know, it confuses me too. This happened this week, so hopefully they'll revert that. But if we go back to the functions list for this site, I have two functions. And you can see that one is scheduled, uh, created February 16th, a day ago, next execution today at 4 a.m. It is now 3.23 a.m. So we got about uh, 40 minutes <laughs> to complete this video. Now I do have a test function right here that executes effectively the same code, but not exactly. So if I just copy this out and I paste and go, that will hit the Netlify function. It will say, hello, 79.16. That output really isn't that important, but you can see that the function did actually run here with an iteration of 80 milliseconds, a runtime of 540 or something like that. Uh, these numbers are fairly high as far as I've experienced with Rust. The memory usage isn't super high compared to other functions, but the duration and the initialization are both quite high. So got some digging to do into that, but otherwise this is what we see on a successful function. So to get here is maybe not as straightforward as I would like. So let's talk a little bit about how this project is set up and what I needed to do to actually get it to work. So I'm just going to get out of the planet scale REPL and let's talk a little bit about how this project is set up. So we've got a Netlify.toml here. The Netlify toml here doesn't have any command at the moment because I am compiling locally and I am checking in the binaries to my functions directory. The reason for that is, then maybe I can find a build log. I can, I can find old build logs here. So if I go to an old build log and I do LDD dash dash version, that will give me the version of glibc that's kind of like around on the system. And the Netlify CI environment, which is their stable product that they're using for everybody for production, what have you, uh, gets very regularly updated. It has glibc 2.31, something to do with Ubuntu here, but effectively glibc 2.31. This is a problem because if we try to compile it on the Netlify CI, like it is, as you can see in this build log, what we end up with is a successful deploy, but when it goes to run, and again, I can't show you this part because they won't let me access the old logs for the old functions. So you'll have to use your imagination a little bit. Um, I can probably find it in a search result actually. So this is some random web page, but the error that you would see if I had the logs to access to show you uh, is something like this, like libm inside of uh, libc version glibc 2.29 not found, required by whatever, whatever. Uh, in our case, it wouldn't be Python 3.6, it would be something else. But the runtime, so the scheduled functions runtime apparently doesn't have the appropriate glibc, which is a problem, right? Because when we build uh, this function, if we look at the dependencies, we can see that we have request in here. And request, we're using Rust TLS TLS instead of the native TLS. But basically, the problem here is ring. So we basically have two options when deploying a Rust function to Netlify. We can either build with libc, in which case we need to target the appropriate version of libc, or we can build uh, statically with muscle, which is a uh, effectively a libc that's meant to be used for static binaries. That is binaries that are fully self-encapsulated. If we try to target libc, libc can't really be built statically into our binary. So that's why we run into this version error. 
basically we built it against a libc and we're using symbols or functions from that libc that don't exist when we try to require the libc on whatever runtime we're running on now the problem with muscle is that ring doesn't run on it and ring is a fairly uh like cornerstone piece of rust tls infrastructure so when we include request the http client we don't get to compile it with muscle. So we have to target the right libc version. So how are we going to do that? Well, the answer comes from the cargo zig build project. So cargo zig build is a fairly recent um, release, I suppose, is the best way to phrase it. But you can basically cargo install cargo zig build. And instead of doing cargo build, you run cargo zig build, and then however you're going to compile. It requires a couple of things. I'm on a Mac, so an M1 Mac. So when I went to install Zig, I could do brew install Zig. Then I already have um, Rust installed, but the target I needed to add was x86 80, uh, x86 80, x86 64 Linux GNU. And then when we run our build, we need to run cargo Zig build with the target of the architecture that we're targeting. So all of the stuff on Netlify runs on Linux which is uh, basically what we saw in the cargo zip build uh, readme. Now, to successfully build this, I also need my uh, database URL because I use a couple of macros to be able to check my SQL queries at compile time. So that's wonderful. The important part is we need to run cargo zig build, and then we need to run with a target for x86-64 unknown Linux GNU. And then the special part, the part that cargo zig build really helps us with is we can target a version of glibc that is whatever version we want to target. So if I run obj dump dash p on a Mac, uh, you don't really need to understand what this is, but basically it's listing some symbols and versions and stuff on the binary that we've built. And we scroll down, we don't really care about the beginnings of this, we don't care about a bunch of this, but we see a bunch of glibc 2.2.5, 2.3.2, and what these are are basically the, the version at which this API was introduced kind of thing. So if you see something in here that is over 2.28, then you need to target a glibc that's lower. In this case, we've already done that. So what we see here is everything is under 2.28. So I'm going to connect to my database. I'm using planet scale. So I use pscale connect. Rust adventure is my database. Main is the branch that I've deployed as my production branch. In this case, uh, I will build against 2.31. And now that we've built, I'll just kill the database connection. If we look in target, we've got debug, release, and x86-64 uh, unknown Linux GNU. And if I run the same command we ran before, so the object dump dash p on the binary that we just built, and we scroll all the way down to the glibc versions section area, we see that right here, we've got something that is referencing glibc 2.29, which is uh, higher than the glibc that we have available to us on the runtime. And therefore that's why we get the version issue. So all of that to say, Cargo Zig Build, wonderful project. It has helped out a lot on this Track Socials project. And uh, yeah, you should definitely check it out if you're having trouble with a particular version of libc, especially if you're doing serverless functions on AWS Lambda or Netlify. There's some work being done to document that in various places. So if you want to know more about that, follow uh, follow me on Twitter. We talk about it quite often with other people. And uh, yeah, let's get into the get let's get into the actual code because the code is also interesting. So let's take a look at this function and what it actually does. This main.rs has a MySQL connection pool to planet scale. Um, it's a basic serverless function, so we use Tokyo main. We get the database URL. Let me get rid of these type inlays because it'll be a little easier to read. This is basically all pool set up with once cell. Once cell is a wonderful library, especially in this case where we want to kind of keep the pool around if the serverless function is still around. And then we call our handler. Our handler down here is async function handler. Um, kind of ignore these little red squiggles because I just uh, killed the database connection and Rust Analyzer is actually calling out to check against the database for these to make sure that my SQL queries are correct, which it can't do because I turned the database connection off. So we don't use any arguments here, right? I have an API gateway proxy request and a context here, but we're not using either of the arguments. We call some function called Twitter. 
which we'll go cover in a second, the function called Twitter returns a follower count. So it goes out, it scrapes the Twitter website for my profile, it gets the follower count, and if we get a successful follower count, we insert it into the tracking table with an ID, a recorded value, and uh, the recorded ad is automatically generated by the database for us. We execute that. Um, I've covered this in other videos, so I'm not gonna go over it now. And then we return the hello with the number that we saw earlier with the valid function invocation. So all of the magic here is happening in this Twitter function. So in lib.rs, we've got this Twitter function. And it's, it's actually pretty cool. So we use request to get, in this case, my profile on twitter.com. Uh, it is all async. All of this is async. The serverless functions are async. We use Tokyo all over the place. Um, I'm using Miet for error handling. Uh, that's not super important. You can use color error, anyhow, anything would work here, really. Uh, we don't even really handle this error in any case. So not a huge deal. This is just a prototype app. We get the HTML for my profile. We wait for it. If there's an error, we turn it into a diagnostic. We return it with Miet. Uh, we get the text of the request. We await that again because it's async. We turn it into a diagnostic if it needs to be. If it's an error, uh, same thing. So what we end up with here is the HTML as a string for my Twitter profile. We parse that document using HTML. And if we go look at HTML, HTML comes from the scraper crate. So if I had to guess where we were spending a bunch of time, it would probably either be in this parse document or it would be in the, pro, the the traversal of this document. Now, given a document that we've parsed and a selector, in this case, it looks very similar to CSS if you've ever seen that before. So a href equals uh, this URL. We're looking basically for an element on the page. We're looking for this element, basically. The seven comma nine one six followers. And if we right click on that, we can see that there's an anchor tag right here that's a little bit small but it says a href equals Christopher Biscardi slash followers because that's the page it wants to send me to. And there's no other real like handles to latch onto because they use React Native Web and React Native Web does a lot of uh, class compilation. So you see CSS dash nine zero one O A O. That is a hash of a set of class rules that have been compiled into a class name and applied to this element. So those change over time. We can't rely on them. We have to rely on this href because this href won't change to get the text. So that's what this is. This is just, hey, parse a selector from the selector we're giving you. So with the document, we can select the element inside of the document. This returns an iterator. So we just call next on it, which returns an option type. So we turn that into a result with OK or. If anything goes wrong here, we basically couldn't find the followers element in the Twitter HTML document, and that will get returned up through our function. If we do have that element, then we get all of the text inside of it. The text inside of it comes in as a vec of empty strings, some characters, and some other characters, basically. So we want to get rid of the empty strings. We want to find the first one that is a number, so something like 7 comma... 906 or whatever the count is right now. And we also don't care about followers, which will also show up in this. So we do a dot find and we match on s.cars. We get the first character from the text that we have been given. So we have a vec of a bunch of uh, strings inside of this element. One of those strings is going to start with a number. If there is a first character, so in this case, if we don't have an empty string and one of the first characters is zero, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yes, you can do a range on characters like this. Um, it works for ASCII characters. It works, I probably wouldn't use it for complicated things, but it does work. And then we can do dot contains on the character. So if the character that our number starts with is a number and is not like followers or an empty string or whatever, then we continue. That also can uh, return an option. So it's possible that we wouldn't find one. We return an error using the Miet macro, if we cannot find one, then what we end up with here is the seven comma, and then a bunch of numbers. So we can't parse the comma into a number automatically in Rust. So we have to filter the comma out. So we do that with a filter. So we do dot cars on the string that we get back. 
we filter all of the characters, we get rid of all of the commas, and then we collect the result into a string. So we end up with, if we had like 7 comma 102, we would end up with 7102. At that point, we can parse it, and because we declared that this number is going to be a U64, it will parse into a U64. Um, if anything fails, we turn it into a diagnostic, return it with MIEP. Otherwise, we return the number. So this is um, a fairly straightforward scheduled function that scrapes Twitter for a follower count, returns it, and then inserts it into the database with a time that it was recorded at. Now, there's also a bunch of other code in here that I've actually pulled from one of the Rust Adventure workshops for dealing with uh, KS UIDs when dealing with MySQL and Planet Scale. So there's a couple of different traits and structs and things like that that I have written that I explained in the workshop. So if you want to find out more about that in more detail, go by Rust Adventure and go through the uh, Planet Scale Pokemon API workshop. And that's really it. It's a function we need to compile uh, for the right glibc. In this case, I'm compiling it on my M1 Mac and sticking the binaries in the functions directory. So you can see tracker and tracker URL right here. The database schema is create table if not exists tracking. Tracking takes an ID, which stores a var binary of 27. That can't be null. This is going to be our KSUID. Recorded at as a date time, it's the current date time when the record is created. And the recorded value is some integer that can't be null. So basically all of these things are required. Our primary key is the KSUID. And that's it, really. We've already covered really all of the dependencies. Um, I've talked about SQLX before, so I'm not going to do that here. The big difference between this and other videos that I've done is that we're using Scraper. Scraper is a wonderful library if you need to scrape websites, which sometimes you can't. So for example, um, one of the sites that I tried doing this to was YouTube, and YouTube uh, doesn't write out the subscriber count into HTML before it sends it down. So the Scraper library is probably less useful for us for that, and we would probably want to try to rely on the API if we could. So yeah, that's it. It's pretty straightforward once you actually know uh, what to do. It is pretty much the same as building any other serverless function that you would want to on Netlify. I think that the the tricky or the the tricky point here was the necessity of Cargo Zig Build, which I'm really happy came out like I don't know a couple days ago. It's it was really good timing because um, it makes it really easy to target a specific libc if you need to. Hopefully, Netlify will restore the logs at some point. Uh, I'm not really sure why this is uh, removed. Shrug. And then hopefully, they also match their libc versions from the build environment and the runtime serverless function uh, containers. But other than that, again, if we take a shell into Rust Adventure main, and we do something like select all from tracking... We see all of the IDs right here. These are copy pastable, by the way, the way that I've inserted these. So if you happen across the code, then know that if you want to select one of these, you can copy and paste this and insert it into a MySQL query. Uh, we have the date time at which it was inserted. You can see that these run fairly consistently, um, which is really interesting. They run about within a second or two of the hour every single time, as far as I can tell which is, you know, pretty fine as far as deviance is concerned, right? Like if I'm trying to run something once an hour, I probably don't need single second precision. So I'm happy with this. You could obviously use this to do any number of other things. In this case, we're just using it to track some follower counts, some vanity metrics. Maybe I'll throw these up on a website or something like that. That would be kind of cool. We can do a function for pulling these numbers back out and displaying them in a graph with like, some graph visualization, that would be cool. So yeah, scheduled functions, Rust, Netlify, Planet Scale, Cargo Zig Build. I hope you enjoyed this dive into uh, something that may feel pretty complicated if you're unfamiliar with glibc versions and stuff like that. And I hope that it helps you. And I will see you next time. Later. <laughs>